Okay, I think we can start. Uh, as I say, uh, those who have been here since 9.15 in the morning, raise your hand just uh, so somebody can pat you on the back. Okay, thank you very much. And it's really a pleasure. And it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Yitzhak Berger, as I said, to make a shachiano as he joins the Torah Motion team. He is professor of five biblical studies at Hunter College of the City University of New York. And Vakasha, time to get started. Esther Mordechai, the legacy of Shaul. Uh, uh, okay, th thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to join the team. Um, I'm going to uh, speak today about uh, connections between uh, uh, Megillat Esther and earlier uh, books in Tanakh, which uh, I have no doubt others uh, must have spoken about earlier today. Um, but hopefully I'll be focusing on some things that um, that others have not and things that are lesser known. Um <clears throat> uh, time permitting, I will kind of try to expand things uh, uh, perhaps a bit beyond what I have here on the handout, um, but we'll kind of see how things go. Um, <clears throat> there are actually several chazals. This is not the norm that you would find a number of chazals with, that, with expansive uh, presentations of parallels uh, between a sefer in Tanakh and an earlier sefer. Uh, or earlier Sfarim. Uh, you certainly have Midrashim make connections between Sfarim and Tanakh and Torah and between Sfarim and Tanakh. That the Medrash does all the time. Um, but something that you might see in kind of a modern day uh, presentation of, of literary parallels uh, is really quite uh, quite distinct what, what we find in Chazal. And what you have here on the uh, on the screen share, the handout is really just a, a, a small percentage uh, of what you find in Chazal in this respect. Um, we're going to be focusing on you know, one aspect of the relationship between Esther uh, and the earlier Sfarim and Tanakh, uh, and that is the, uh, the legacy of Shaul HaMelech, of Shevet Ben Yamin generally, uh, that you find alluded to in, uh, in the Megillah. Um, and uh, if you just look at the first source that's on the screen, um, here is a Gemara in that or that long stretch of pages uh, in the Gemara, in Gemara Megillah uh, that Darshan's uh, Megillah is there, um, uh, and which writes as follows. I'll read the Hebrew, but you have the uh, the English right beneath, and I will also just summarize in English. Rachel's sniut, the modesty, um, the humility of Rachel, um, <clears throat> resulted in her meriting that King Saul came from her. Uh, Shaul's modesty was resulted in uh, Esther uh, descending from him. Now, the sniut of Rachel, that's already something more midrashic. Um, uh, many of us are probably familiar uh, with the uh, commonly cited Midrash uh, that uh, Rachel kind of went along with the uh, the effort to have Leah, her older sister, marry Yaakov instead of herself. Um, and she kind of humbly, submissively, and even in her, in her own quiet way, actively went along with it. Uh, so based on that Midrashic interpretation, uh, the Gemara here assumes that in this lineage, we have this characteristic of sort of a certain quiet humility. Uh, and that manifests itself again in Shaul HaMelech. Now, the truth of the matter is that it manifests itself in Shaul HaMelech in a whole variety of ways, uh, many of which we're not going to be seeing today, but I may uh, summarize um, uh, the Gemara here quotes one in particular, Matzniut Haitab Shaul. What is uh, the humility that Shaul manifested? This is part of the story of the coronation uh, of Shaul HaMelech. It's a very lengthy sequence of chapters in Sefer Shmuel, uh, where uh, Shaul HaMelech is going to find uh, some lost donkeys. He can't find them. Uh, eventually, he goes to Shmuel the Navi, uh, who tells him, don't worry about the donkeys, but God told me that you're supposed to be the king. Uh, and in various respects, you see Shaul react very humbly. 
one of those ways is that when Shaul goes home, he meets his uncle, uh, who uh, hears that he uh, had an encounter with Shmuel the Navi, asks him what happened in that encounter. Shaul responds uh, by telling him, oh, he said that the lost donkeys were found, but Shaul did not, as you see here, did not say a word uh, about uh, Shmuel having told him uh, that he is to be the next king uh, of Israel. Um, and it takes an awful lot for Shaul to actually break out uh, and act as the king of Israel. Um, this uh, expression, et dvar hamlucha lo gidlo, that the, the matter of the kingship, Shaul did not uh, acknowledge when he was speaking to his uncle, this is one of several um, parallels that one finds between Shaul HaMelech uh, and Esther. Um, and uh, uh, let's take a look at this next source, which is a very interesting one. It was brought to my attention um, by uh, the, the Rosh Yeshiva of, the, of Shor Yoshu, which is a, a yeshiva in my local community, um, in a totally different context, but I was very fortunate uh, that, he, that he brought it up. Um, uh, this comes from a, a, a uh, rabbi from the modern period, Rabbi Akiva Yosef Schlesinger, who was Rabbi Akiva Yosef Schlesinger is an interesting story unto itself. Um, he was a Hungarian Jew who was born in the mid-19th century. Uh, he immigrated to Eretz Yisrael uh, and died in 1922. So he was there during a period when many people were uh, coming, many Zionists and others were coming and settling uh, in Israel. As he was a student of the Hassam Sofer, who was a major uh, opponent of... Stop turning it off. Reform. Um, and uh, he was a very fiery personality himself. Um, so this very fiery personality, right, you can you can actually see um, the, the personality coming through in what Rabbi Akiva Yosef Schlesinger says here uh, about um, the connection between Shaul Hamelech's et Dvar Hamluchalo Higidlo that he would he was a reticent and would not acknowledge that he was chosen as king. And a parallel line that you find in Migilat is there to, to a similar effect. Um, <clears throat> he is commenting on a line in the Megillah, uh, <laughs> Mordechai is speaking to Esther and telling her um, that if you keep silent at this time, right, then um, your own household uh, will not have a redemption. It will actually perish. Uh, and uh, there will be salvation for the Jews from elsewhere. But this is your moment uh, to salvage uh, the legacy of your own ancestry. And uh, he uh, comments as follows. Um, he says, Nir el haspir omro ba'it hazot. That language, if you keep silent at this time, why did the Megillah, why did Mordechai have to say, if you are silent at this time? Why not just say, Esther, if you are silent, uh, then it will have the negative con consequence in question. Why, why is he emphasizing this time? And here he cites a different Midrash that makes a similar point uh, to the one that we've seen, which is that the legacy of Shaul HaMelech of Esther, and really all of the descendants of Rachel, right? Rachel being the mother of Yosef and of Shevet bin Yamin, from whom Esther and Shaul descend, that legacy uh, is one of reticence, of quiet, of humility. And Mordechai tells Esther, um, <clears throat> uh, let's back up a bit, right? Um, so he, he, first, the, the parallel that he cites in the bolded letters, at Dvar Hamlucha Lo Higilo, which we've seen, Shaul did not disclose his coronation. And in Esther, we have a parallel line, Ein Esther Magedat Molad Tava Et Ama, one of several parallels. Uh, the same language, it's actually one of two psukim in the Megillah um, that uses this language of Lo Higida. We have Ein Esther Magedat, we have Lo Higida Esther. Esther did not disclose who she was even after she was chosen as queen. Why not? 
um, because Mordechai told her not to. It's part of Esther's uh, humility, reticence, subservience. And continues Rav Schlesinger, this was what Mordechai meant um, when he made his remark to Esther. Even though your legacy is to maintain a silent posture, not all times are the same. Now the time is different. This is a time you must go out uh, and make your voice heard. So if you're going to keep quiet, even at this time, right, then um, you're going to lose this opportunity to rectify something that went wrong uh, in your own legacy. Now, what went wrong in the legacy of Esther, Mordechai, Shaul HaMelech, Rachel? What went wrong uh, with that silence? Right? We've said that Shaul was humble. He did not want to disclose uh, the Malchut. He did not want, uh, really doesn't, didn't seem to want the job altogether. What went wrong? And if you know the story of Shaul HaMelech, right, then you'll know that, yes, there were some very positive aspects uh, to Shaul's humility. Uh, yes, it's true that a, a Melech Yisrael, a king, has to be humble. And that may have even been the point of Hashem choosing Shaul to be a king, because in the law of the king that's laid out in Sefer Dvarim, it tells you that a Melech Yisrael has to be very different from a king from other nations. A Melech Yisrael must be uh, somebody uh, who does not raise himself up above others. Uh, rather, what, what does the king of Israel have to do? He has to write a Sefer Torah. He has to read in that Sefer Torah all the days of his life and recognize that his job is to implement God's law, not to lord over other people. So in one respect, Shaul HaMelech's humility was very favorable, and he was chosen probably in part for that reason. However, um, Shaul HaMelech loses the kingship uh, for uh, having done certain, um, certain things that fell short. And uh, the most famous one, of course, which we'll uh, see a reference to a bit later on in the Shir, uh, is in Perik Tetvav and Shmuel Aleph. Uh, we find that Shaul, when he was told uh, to kill out uh, the Amalekim. Uh, he did not do so the way he was supposed to. He left King Agag alive, uh, and uh, he allowed that uh, a number of the livestock could be taken as spoils, again, something that he was not allowed to do. And Shaul basically tells Shmuel when he's called out on this uh, that he let the people do what they wanted. He did not assert himself. And this becomes the flaw of Shaul's kingship. And so this is what Rabbi Akiva Yosef Schlesinger uh, is saying when he's reading that line in the Megillah this way. He's saying, uh, Mordechai is telling Esther, this is your opportunity to rectify the reputation of the kingship uh, of the tribe of Binyamin uh, and of the family that you descend from since Mordechai and Esther descend from Kish, who is the, who is the uh, the father of Shaul, so there's a family relationship there as well. Where do we see that the Megillah is really trying to line up Esther with Shaul? So first, let's take a look first at another uh, parallel that the Midrash draws us to. This is a lesser known Midrash on the screen in front of you, the Midrash Abba Gurion, um, which uh, calls attention to a pasuk in the very first parak of the Megillah. This is Memuchan telling the king that Vashti, after refusing to do what the king asked, needs to be deposed. Um, and her kingship, right, her royal position, should be given to her peer, who is better than she. mimena. Now, where does this language come from? Right in, in an observation, again, made uh, by, by modern scholars as well, 
Um, the Midrash says, With this language, the kingship was taken away from Esther's great-grandfather, Shaul. We have a line from Shmuel Aleph in that parak that talks about Shaul's failure to kill the Amalekim properly. Uh, and when Shmuel finally tells Shaul, you've had enough opportunities to come clean, uh, but God is taking the Malchut away from you, it uses a very similar expression, and this is where the language in the Megillah of Liru'uta HaTovam Imena comes from. The Midrash here is alluding to the fact uh, that whereas the Malchut was taken away from Shaul, um, there will be a rehabilitation of the reputation of uh, the royalty of Shevet bin Yamin uh, with the emergence of Esther as a successful queen who advocates on behalf of Am Yisrael uh, here in the Megillah. It's not going to be Malchut over all of Bnei Yisrael in Eretz Yisrael. That uh, ends up being reserved for Shevet Yehuda. Um, but what we find here, and for that matter, what we will uh, note shortly, uh, elsewhere in Tanakh, is that you find that the B'nai Rachel, right, the descendants of Rachel, uh, achieve a very cert, a very, a very specific uh, kind of success, leadership success in Galut, um, and this, this, so this is where the leadership of Binyamin is going to shine here in the Megillah as well. <clears throat> so then, what in fact are the parallels, right? How does the Megillah draw this? relationship between Esther and Shaul. Well, so here on the screen in front of you, uh, <clears throat> let's look at the top line where the Megillah introduces Mordechai. Right? The Pasuk that we all say uh, together before the Baal Kriya says it, There was a Jewish man who descended from several generations all the way up to Kish, a Benjaminite, Ishimini. Right? This uh, parallels a line uh, in the text in Shmuel that introduces Shaul's kingship. The beginning of that story reads, Vayihi Yishmi bin Yamin. There was a man from bin Yamin, Ushmo Kish, and his name was Kish. There we have the great grandfather of Mordechai. Right? followed by several generations, Ben so-and-so, Ben so-and-so, and in the end, Ben Ishimini. You just look at those two introductions, and it already appears that the Megillah uh, may well be seeking to draw an, a link uh, between Kish, the father of Shaul, and Mordechai, uh, the adoptive father of Esther. If there is a parallel drawn between Kish and Mordechai, father and adoptive father, uh, it would follow that the Megillah is implying a possible link between Shaul, the son of Kish, and Esther, the adoptive daughter uh, of Mordechai. And in fact, you continue um, <clears throat> with the characterization of Esther that you find shortly thereafter in the Megillah. And what does the Megillah tell us? It tells us that Mordechai was raising uh, Hadassah, he Esther, right? Um, and uh, we're told that Esther was beautiful. Uh, likewise, in the story in Sefer Shmuel, uh, the text tells us that the son of Kish was named Shaul, he was Bachur Vatov, which the translation in front of you, which is typical of translation, says, and he was young and handsome, and there was not among the children of Israel a more handsome person than he. So when the Hebrew says, uses here the word Tov, it is commonly understood to mean his physical appearance. Um, as you see from the last phrase in the Pasuk, Mishichmo Vamalagavoa Mikol Ha'am, he was a head taller than everyone else. So both texts emphasize the striking appearance uh, of the relevant son or daughter. Uh, Shaul is exceedingly handsome. Esther is exceedingly beautiful. And in turn, they make uh, a notable impression uh, on all those who see them. Um, and uh, here you have uh, shortly thereafter in Esther, after Esther is 
that are brought to the palace uh, when the king is supposed to evaluate all of the women to see who he would like to be his queen. Um, and uh, you see the bolded lines here. Um, there is consistent reference to all of the people being struck by Esther, uh, who was in their eyes greater than all of the other women. In the eyes of all who saw her, and the king loved Esther more than all of the women, Mikol Hanashim and Mikol Habdullah. Um, likewise, in <laughs> likewise in in the Shmuel, we find right by Yigba Mikol Ha'am Bishichmo Vamala. Right, he was taller than all of the people from from his shoulders up. Uh, and then when the, he finally emerges as king in the context of his public coronation. And Shmuel points to Shaul, uh, and uh, who had just, he had been hiding in keeping with his humility. But when he is finally drawn out, by Omer Shmuel El Kol Ha'am, Shmuel says to all of the people, do you see? Ki en kamohu b'chol ha'am. There's none like him among all of the people. Um, uh, and all of the people uh, shouted, kol ha'am, by Yareu kol ha'am, and they said, yechi ha'mel. Now, um, Let's uh, to to continue drawing the parallel. Let's consider a pasuk that we've already seen, uh, specifically the pasuk cited by Rav Schlesinger when he was uh, interpreting Mordechai's intention here in telling Esther that if you are quiet today, um, then you will lose that opportunity uh, to rectify uh, the problems uh, that emerged uh, in the kingship of your ancestors. Um, the line in Esther, as we've seen, as you see in front of you, if you keep silent at this time, right, there will be a salvation for the Jews from elsewhere. Right, and you and your ancestral house uh, will perish. Um, so this line, certainly has the meaning right, that we've already cited. He's warning her, you can't keep quiet now. Um, in keeping with the tendencies of your lineage. But uh, what we haven't uh, noted to this point is that uh, the notion of being maharish, of being silent in an expression of humility, uh, actually finds expression in the text's characterization of Shaul himself. Uh, in the same sequence of chapters that describe Shaul's emergence as a king, um, here we have right after his public coronation, there were some people uh, who did not uh, participate in uh, in praising the king and in demonstrating their fidelity to him. Uh, they looked at him and they actually you know, said to themselves, the externals don't matter. Uh, they probably saw some of the, uh, what they saw as probably an excess of humility. Um, and they disdained him. Uh, and the last phrase in this pasuk is vayehi kemacharish, right? Shaul, in response to these people who disdained him, remained silent, right? One of the reasons that the text uh, you, uh, adopts the expression in Esther of him, hacharish tacharishi, uh, is apparently because it is drawing on the phrase vayehi kemacharish. This is uh, an expression of Shaul's humility, and Mordechai is warning Esther, you can't display that same expression of humility uh, in this context, because this is a time uh, where you need to, to, uh, to speak up. The last phrase in this pasuk, you and your, your ancestral house will perish, likewise probably derives from a phrase in the story of Shaul. What happens in the story of Shaul? Um, this is near the beginning of Shaul's uh, coronation. This is the the private coronation that happens at the beginning of that story, when Shaul uh, is looking for his donkeys, approaches Shmuel, and Shmuel tells him, don't worry about the donkeys, because ulemi kol chemdat Yisrael, halo lecha ulechol beit avicha. On whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and all your father's house? This The line ulechol beit avicha uh, seems to have served as the foundation for the line in the Megillah, um, in other words, the initial 
call to Shaul HaMelech to be the king for all of Bnei Yisrael, something that was lost in the dynasty of Shaul, well, that is something that Esther can gain back if she, instead of showing humility and reserve where it's not called for, as Shaul did in the story of Amalek, if she instead comes forward, overcomes her tendency to you of humility and reserve and speaks up, confronts the king, um, uh, and takes the necessary initiative uh, to save the Jews. <clears throat> we continue forward, um, and ultimately, uh, this is in fact um, what Esther does, of course, as we as we know, uh, Shaul, uh, I'm sorry, Esther comes forward and uh, against her nature approaches the king. Uh, there's the famous Perik Dalit in the Megillah when Mordechai tells uh, Esther, what we've just seen, right? Your whole, right? Your whole purpose here is going to be lost uh, if you don't come forward. And by the end of that parak, um, Esther is commanding Mordechai what to do. So the last uh, pasuk and parak Dalit of the of the Megillah is um, that Mordechai went alav Esther. Now she's in charge, right? And then we know in the story of the Megillah uh, that Esther comes forward. Uh, and uh, uses some very, uh, very clever uh, tactics in order to uh, kill, to have Haman killed, and then ultimately uh, to enable the Jews to fight back uh, with the um, uh, with the um, government on the side of the Jews. Um, so here, so the, what you have here on the top of the screen is a very famous, um, a very famous parallel. Um, Shaul's failure in uh, in Perik Tetvav and Shmuel Aleph was, of course, uh, that he did not kill Agag and that he took and that he allowed the people to take of the spoils, uh, even though uh, even though they were not supposed to. Now, here in Esther, after the Jews win the day, the Jews are actually supposed to be allowed to take from the spoils. Right? The, the, there is a line in the Megillah uh, that appears repeatedly of. Ushlalam lavoz, the Jews are allowed to take of the spoils. Uh, and what's uh, remarkable is that they do not. And it says three times in Periktet of Esther, Uva uh, Biza lo shalchu et yadam, the Jews did not extend their hand to the spoils, even though they were allowed to. Why? So this, as many people have pointed out, this is part of the corrective of the failures of uh, the legacy of Shaul. Shaul allowed the people to take from spoils, even though they should not have the people, the Jews in the story of Esther, under the leadership of Esther and Mordechai, do not take from spoils, even though they are allowed to. Here's a lesser known um, <clears throat> example. Um, in the, uh, if you continue to scroll down, and uh, just a moment, there we go. Um, there are various points uh, in the story of Shaul HaMelech uh, where, um, where descendants of Shaul die, and not only die, but are impaled. Um, you have in the story of Shaul's death that it's not only Shaul that dies on the battlefield, but three of his sons die on the battlefield. Um, and in the, top, uh, in the top pasuk that you have quoted in front of you, you see the text telling us uh, that the body of Shaul and three of and the, his three fallen sons were impaled on a wall. Later in the story in Sefer Shmuel, um, because of an issue that we won't uh, we won't get into here, um, but seven additional uh, sons and grandsons of Shaul have to be given over to be killed, um, and you find here that seven of them are once again impaled. Um, you hear the word shivatayim, which you see in bold, um, they were impaled on a mountain. So we have all together three plus seven sons and grandsons of Shaul, along with Shaul himself, uh, who are impaled. This is a an expression of the failure of the Malchut of Shaul. He ultimately is killed in battle. His sons are, are killed in battle, including the son who should have taken over for him. Um, and uh, seven additional ones impaled later on. This, of course, um, finds a parallel in the Megillah, except in this time, 
It's not the descendants of Shaul who are being killed and impaled, uh, but it is the descendants of Shaul or from the family of Shaul, Esther and Mordechai, who are responsible for fighting back against the enemy um, and hanging Haman, uh, and who was, of course, from Amalek, uh, and 10 of Haman's sons. Why 10 of Haman's sons? That stands in parallel uh, to the three plus seven sons and grandsons of Shaul uh, who are impaled in that story. Um, let's kind of complete the discussion with, uh, with one more parallel that's of a different sort. Uh, I had mentioned earlier uh, that it's not merely a matter of, um, of Esther and Mordechai rectifying the legacy of Shaul. Um, there are many parallels in the Megillah to the story of Yosef in Mitzrayim. Yosef, a son of Rachel, like Esther and Mordechai, uh, Yosef is a ruler, a viceroy in Galut, in Galut Mitzrayim, the exile of Egypt. Um, and he too, like Mordechai and Esther, saves his brethren from a, a, a physical threat. Uh, in the case of Esther, it's annihilation by Haman. In the case of, uh, of, uh, of Yosef, right, there is a famine and Yosef saves his family in famine. The reality is that Yosef does something uh, much, uh, I, I shouldn't say more important, but equally important in the story uh, in Sefer Breshid. Uh, when he brings his, uh, his kin, his brethren, down to Mitzrayim uh, and feeds them. In that story, after a terrible division among the sons of Yaakov, uh, where the sons of Leah and the sons of Rachel, uh, in particular Yosef and his brothers, are at odds with one another, uh, and the brothers of Yosef sell him into slavery, uh, and Yosef gives them a difficult time when they come to Egypt initially, but ultimately Yosef brings the family together in Mitzrayim uh, in advance of the redemption that will take place in Sefer Shmo. Uh, if we go back to the very beginning of the story, of the division between Yosef and his brothers in Breshit Perek Lamedalet, uh, we find the Pasuk Vayiru Echav, his brothers saw Ki Mikol Banav, right, that their father loved him more than all of his sons, Vayistu Oto, they hated him, Veloyachlu Dabruol Shalom, they could not speak in peace to him. Well, there is one other Pasuk in Tanakh that has the combination of the word Echav, his brothers, uh, the verb dalet bet reish to speak, um, and the word shalom. And that is the very last pasuk in Megillat Esther. This pasuk uh, makes reference or alludes to uh, a number of uh, passages in Tanakh. Its language is very distinctive, uh, but what's important for our purposes here uh, is the language of echav and the verb dalet bet reish and shalom. What's the, what's the pasuk telling us? Mordechai HaYehudi, who had become the viceroy to Achashverosh, was great among the Jews. Not just he was not just somebody who um, was able to exert influence with the king, right? He was also he also rose to a position of leadership among the Yehudim. and he was well accepted among all the multitudes of his brethren. Doresh Tov Amo, he advocated for good for all of his people. Vidover Shalom, and he would speak for peace. Uh, for all his offspring. Very distinctive language, uh, but the Megillah is ostensibly telling us here that just as back in the story of Yosef, there was division among Jews, but Yosef, that leader from the descendants of Rachel, uh, brought Klal Yisrael, which was then just a clan, but he brought them together in Mitzrayim in advance of a redemption. Uh, so, so too, Mordechai and Esther, beyond what they do for rectifying the legacy of Shaul HaMelech, um, also bring B'nai Yisrael together in Galut. Um, they become unifying forces, uh, and with that, uh, they are able to, by implication, lay the groundwork uh, for a redemption that is yet to come. Um, okay, mm -hmm. I think we've gone uh, as long as I'm supposed to, so I'm going to check the, um, um, the, uh, the chat. Um, and uh, I am not seeing any uh, any particular. There, there are a couple of comments. We have a question. Uh, I'm sorry. There are a couple of comments in the chat um, box. Yeah, I see. Okay. 
So okay. here I have a question: Who is the king who kills the remainder of Shaul's? Uh, who's the remainder of Shaul's family? It's not that all of the remainder of Shaul's family uh, die. There was there there is a legacy of Shaul, as you see uh, in the the Megillah. Seems to be, even though it doesn't say Mordechai and Esther quite descend from Shaul himself, but they do descend from Kish Shaul's father. Um, there's so it's not the case that all of Shaul's descendants are killed. Uh, it's not actually a king who kills the remainder of Shaul's family. It it involves uh, the story of the Givonim uh, in Sefer Shmuel. So it'll be a little bit hard for me to give the full background here now. Um, the uh, the next comment Mordechai is called a a, a Judean, not a Benjaminite, and not a descendant of Rachel. Yes, uh, so that's an excellent point, and I, I definitely think that that's part of what's going on. Um, the uh, the fact that Mordechai is both an Ish Yehudi and an Ish Yemini, he is called at the beginning uh, like a Judean, quote unquote, not a Judean in terms of being the tribe of, of Judah, but an Ish Yehudi just means you're from the kingdom of Judah. So he's on the one hand from the kingdom of Judah. His legacy is from Binyamin. Um, but the language of Ish Yehudi does, I think, suggest, as you're suggesting here, uh, that um, Mordechai brings together um the the Jews who identify as Shev, or as members of Shevet Yehuda and Jews who identify as members of Shevet Binyamin, because clearly there was very significant tension um, at, at some points in history. I mean, there are multiple books in Tanakh uh, that explicitly or implicitly uh, make clear that God shows Yehuda to be the the leaders in Eretz Yisrael. Um, and uh, for example, I mean, you have the story at the end of uh, Sefer Shoftim that sort of very harshly portrays uh, Shevet Binyamin and what happened there with something terrible that was done uh, in the territory of Binyamin. Um, so there's clearly tension there. There's clearly a need for many Sfarim and Tanakh uh, to underscore that Yehuda takes precedence for kingship in Eretz Yisrael, but simultaneously, um, there is this role that Shevet Binyamin can play still in order to rehabilitate their legacy, and that's following the model of Yosef to unify uh, Klal Yisrael in Galut, in advance of a redemption that will take place under a leader from Yehuda. So I think you're 100% right about Ish Yehudi and Ish Yemini reflecting that, uh, um, that unification. Um <clears throat> And uh, uh, one more comment that Mordechai is referred to as a Jew uh, rather than a Hebrew um, and not a member of Judah's tribe per se. That's correct, right? When it says that Mordechai is an Ish Yehudi, it does not mean uh, that he's a member of the, of the tribe of Yehuda. He's, he's a member of the kingdom of Yehuda. The kingdom of Yehuda is the only kingdom that survives because the northern kingdom goes to exile and does not return. Um, so the kingdom of Yehuda in the south uh, had members of other tribes there, including many people from Binyamin, clearly, uh, uh, certainly members of Levi, um, whom uh, we obviously still have descendants of Levi today. Um, so when it says Mordechai is an Ish Yehudi, you're absolutely right. It does not mean that he is a, um, that he's a member of the tribe of Yehuda, but that he's a member of the kingdom of Yehuda, which is really the same thing as saying Mordechai the Jew. And as they, in Hebrew, Yehudi is Jew or Ooh. Judean. Um, a Judean in this context means a member of the the uh, the kingdom of of what we call Yehud, right? Yehud uh, or Judea, uh, which had members of Binyamin in it, and it's real. That's why the term Jew emerges because the word the word Jew, which is really Judean, uh, reflects the fact that the uh, the, uh, the members of Bnei Israel who survived are essentially the ones uh, who uh, who. Uh, descend from uh, people in the kingdom of Yehuda who were allowed to maintain their integrity as a people, even in Galut, uh, and who ultimately were allowed to come back. Um, okay. okay, so I think we're good. Yeah, any uh, quick comments from yes. uh, anyone to say something? I wondered whether the the silence of God in the Megillah is the paradigm that's followed by Mordechai and Esther. Um, and I, I, it's an interesting question. And uh, first of all, hello. I think we've met before. Um, the um, 
uh, is the humility of, let's say, the, hum the humility. Mor Mordechai doesn't really display humility or reserve, but the but es what, what Esther's reserve uh, suggests uh, God, God, sort of God's hiddenness. So I, by think, I think I would like to suggest that that also explains the Kol de Mama Daka, which announces, which fails to receive the, vo the voice of the announcer of the Mashiach. Uh huh. Okay. Um, hey, I, I I I hear that, and as as for your earlier comment, you know, I, thematically, you know, Esther is being silent and God's being silent. It's an interesting question, but uh, certainly li from a literary standpoint, you have in Esther's name uh, both re references. And as you have in Esther's name the uh, you know Esther, which Chazal uh, say Esther comes from the word uh, Seter, which is obviously a drusha. It's not the real source of the name, but. Um, I think that that is uh, implied from a literary standpoint. Um, the uh, Chazal's drasha that Esther comes from Hester Panim of God, uh, and the reason I think that's correct is because of a literary reference that I don't, I haven't seen made anywhere. Um, but uh, there is a pasuk in Dvarim, um, one of the one of the pasukim in Dvarim that speaks of God hiding His face, not the one that Chazal quote in this context, which is Hester, uh, you know. Uh, uh, astir, astir, but the, you, you also have a pasuk, astira panai mehem, right? I will hide my face from him, erem acharitam, I will see what their what their uh, uh, destiny will be. Ki dor banim lo emunba. Now dor tapuchoteima, there you have a language of an upside down generation with the verb hepe chaf there, which is a theme in the Megillah, and the verb appears twice in the Megillah, the nahafochu, um, right about how the theme of reversal in the Megillah, uh, plus banim lo emun ban people who have no aluf mem nun they have no trust in them they don't trust God. Well, the very in the very beginning, I think either in that very pasuk or right near that very pasuk where Esther is introduced, it is it is the very pasuk where Esther is introduced. What's the very first verb you see? Vayhi omein et hadasa. Yeah, by he and it's Aleph Mem Nun, by he Omein et Hadassah he Esther. So I think what the Megill is doing there is alluding to Astira Panay Mehem Banim Lo Eimunba. And Mordechai's sort of commitment, Mordechai's covenantal commitment there is being transmitted to Esther. And if he is Omein here, it doesn't just mean he's raising her, it means he is restoring um, the commitment to God that's absent in the, uh, in, in, uh, in that pasuk and sefer dvarim, banim lo emunba, um, and that's Esther Astira Panay So um, beautiful. Thank you. Okay, it's good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. I mean, uh, again, if you were here for all seven talks, please raise your hand. We'll uh, say thank you very much. Oh, very nice. Okay. I just added up. We were like close to a thousand people. If you add up all the seven things, so I really want to, uh, which, you know, want to uh, thank everybody for, for, for coming about not quite at a thousand, but not 950 about that. Anyways, um, tomorrow night, really um, a pleasure. And I hopefully make pouring more meaningful for all of us. And that we should have pouring to be the month of the Gula, you know, Gula, Mesmach, Gula, Gula, and all the beautiful things that happen in the Megillah. We should uh, merit to happen in our time. Um, tomorrow night, of um, Dr. Shapiro continues. He, he just started last week on, on the Musa dispute, so all are welcome at 30. We'll have a regular shirim th 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 this week, every day, all th through Friday. Of course, next Sunday, Purim, we will uh, be giving Mishloch, Manor, and Matanot, Levyonim, and in eating and drinking and who knows what else people are doing. Um, so we won't have our regular shirim next week, Rabbi Liebtag and Dr. Gesundheit. But we'll continue right after that. And please, God, we're uh, in the middle of planning some stuff for 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 Pesach. And uh, we look forward to learning with you always and uh, for your ideas and comments and uh, anything constructive, comments, uh, both positive and negative, we always like to hear. So thank you very much. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Berger. Welcome to Torah Motion. Hope you enjoyed being part Thank of you. Uh, you know, it's uh, nice to meet you. Or I don't think we've ever met. Same, Same uh, here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You know, you were in YU after me, I assume. <laughs> you know, uh, so. That uh, could be. I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little older than I sometimes look. So uh, oh, Okay. Okay. But, uh, who, who, can I ask who's, who, who shear were you in? Were you in YU? I was in Rosenzweig's shear for four years. I mean, I'm, I'm 54 now. Yeah, um, so, so you're, you're still younger than me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the um, I have I, I there I, in the past I have uh, you know I have uh, 
at least at least once I have joined in a Torah in Moshe Shear. So oh, of course, no, everybody joins in. It's not point. the best, uh, and uh, um, I, my I, my wife is also a relative of uh, I think one of the uh, one of the support of the early supporters. Uh, uh, Phil Schwartz from Toronto, I'm sure oh, you know. Oh, sure. And, sure. Phil um, Schwartz I've known for, you know, my whole life pretty much. Right. His daughter was in school with me, you know, Adrian, and uh, they're, they've been living in Israel a long, long time. But yeah, I see Phil. I mean, I hope he's doing okay. He's aged, I know, a little bit, but uh, I mean, he's probably close to 90 already. But uh, yeah, he's about, he's about that. Yeah. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. I did see him in Israel a couple of visits ago, but yeah. Um, very nice. It is a small. Who, yeah, my who, wife, you know, my wife's your wife? is very, very close to him. If I can so ask, who, my who, wife's name. My wife's name is is Dietzo. She her her maiden name is Schwartz. I mean, uh, Dietzo oh, Schwartz. Schwartz. But and, where, uh, you where know, did she her, grow her, up? Her, not not in Toronto. She didn't grow up in Toronto. No, in, in, in Lawrence. But her father is a first cousin of Phil Schwartz. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, um, thank yeah, you, yeah. Kelman. I mean, the Ke Kelman from Toronto. There are other other connections. My my my. I mean, I knew Maury Kelman. Uh, my brother. My, That's my Maury's my brother. brother. And um, uh, my grandfather was who was a rav in uh, in, in Brooklyn was quite friendly with the rabbi. My Kelman. Uncle. That's yeah, my uncle, a, Abraham Kelman, Kelman from Prospect okay, Park. Right. That's my um, yeah. Was that the same Rabbi Kelman who was in Prospect? Who was a uh, yeah, was, yeah. From he was in Prospect, or he founded the school. He founded the school. The he, one who was the principal, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's uh, that's yeah, that's my uncle. And who your grandfather? What on your father's side? Your mother's side? My mother's side. Yeah. So what's what's the name? The name, the name, is, the name, is, oh, name is name is name is Rabinowitz. Rabinowitz. My grandfather had a shul. Uh, he had one shul called Tiferes Sagra and another shul in Crown Heights called Chovavei Torah. Um, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyways, very nice. So we we are nice. already mishpach already. That's yeah, that, that's right. that, that, that that doesn't take long. Baruch Hashem. That's part of the wonderful part of being part of the Jewish people. I'm Yehudi. Ish Yehudi. Uh, in its many variations. Okay. Be well, okay. everybody. Thank you very much. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Outstanding, Rabbi Kilman. Outstanding. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming as always in your comments. And uh, thank you. Okay, be well, everybody. Thank you so much. Okay, time to eat breakfast or lunch. I don't know where we're up to exactly, but okay. All right, have a great day. Bye bye.